those long Caught somewhere between a boy and man She was 17 and she was far from in between It was summertime in northern Michigan
Seems like Labour, two points ahead. Yeah, they've just got their noses ahead. Our exit poll is predicting that the Conservatives are the largest party. If this exit poll is right, Andrew, I will publicly eat my hat on your programme. Of all the scenarios imagined, this seemed the least imaginable. The sitting Prime Minister off to see the Queen for a new mandate as the undisputed winner. Then we can take these islands with our proud history and build an even prouder future. Together, we can make Great Britain greater still. That the government should call a general election to be held on the 8th of June. And what we're saying is the Conservatives are the largest party. Note, they don't have an overall majority at this stage. It's time, frankly, that uh, the opposition summoned up the nerve to submit themselves to the judgment of, of our collective boss, which is the people of, of the UK. Now, in a few moments, polling stations across the United Kingdom will close, the voting will be over, and we'll be able to reveal the result of our exit poll. That's our first hint of the possible result. So, as Big Ben reaches 10 o'clock, we are standing by with those crucial exit poll figures. Here they are. Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a Conservative majority. News, if you're just joining us here on election 2019, at 8 minutes past 5 in the morning, is that the Conservatives are now past the finishing post. They have won a majority in this campaign, and that is the formal result for us. As you can see, we've won before, and now we need to deliver a strategy to win again. Nine years ago, before I was a minister, and long before I became chairman, I was a 40-40 target seat MP. And in target seats like mine, the 2015 general election wasn't about Labour's failures. It wasn't about Jeremy Corbyn or getting Brexit done. It was about our local record of delivery. In just two years' time, our record of delivery will once again be a deciding factor in how people vote. So we need a massive effort to get our local success stories out, to share the incredible things we've achieved together as a party, and to let people know about the important work that we're still doing, creating jobs, investing in public services, and improving lives. And that's what the 8020 Target Seat campaign is all about. This is a targeted, focused campaign based on the 80 marginal seats we need to hold and the 20 marginal seats we have a serious chance of gaining. We're going to need a huge effort from everyone here today, every single activist, every single member and every single association, just like we had in 2015. Because whilst the last two elections were short and snappy, this campaign will take place over two years, just like the 2015 campaign. No one is saying it's going to be easy, but if we pull together, I know from personal experience what a difference it can make. And I'm thrilled to say that we've already hit the ground running. We've got new campaign managers across the country helping MPs tell their stories. The first leaflet of the 8020 campaign is hitting doorsteps this summer. And over the next two years, there'll be an opportunity for everyone here and at home to play a role whether that's sharing content on social media or talking to voters and changing minds. I'm confident that if we come together, put that effort in and get our message out, we can win the next general election. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the hustings. We've got two excellent candidates and they're both clearly ready to be Prime Minister. But no matter which candidate you choose, let's remember that the country will be making a choice two years from now, a Labour government or a Conservative government. So let's get to work.
Hi, I'm James, the campaign manager for Bolsover. You probably know the seat because in 2019 we released Dennis Skinner, the beast of Bolsover, from his parliamentary chains and elected Mark Fletcher, the first ever Conservative, to represent this constituency. I've worked with Mark since May this year, helping to spread his local success stories, highlight our levelling up actions and strengthen our vote. Now we've already delivered over 32,000 leaflets and surveys, but I'm not slowing down because I've got big new targets to meet. We need to recruit new canvassers, new deliverers, new activists to spread Mark's message, not just on the doorstep, but on social media as well. That's on top of running local issue campaigns, such as here in Glatwell, with the speeding campaign for the A617, and organising community events. It's tough work, but it makes a huge difference, and none of it would be possible without members like you, and supporters like you. My position is funded entirely through donations, so every member, donor and supporter has the chance to play a massive role. Because although it's my job to grow the team here in Bolsover, campaign managers and successful campaigns rely on people across the country for support, whether that's knocking on doors or chipping in. So I hope that over the next two years, 80-20 candidates and MPs like Mark Fletcher can rely on you. Please welcome Peter Booth, Chairman of the National Convention. Good evening, Eastbourne. If any of you are here to see a production of Gangster Granny, you're in the wrong theatre, so you might want to leave now. This is the fourth hustings on our national tour, and it's good to be back in Sussex, where I lived for many years, and where I was chairman of Brighton Kemp Town. Thank you all for attending this evening. It is good to see so many friends from Brighton and colleagues that is sitting here in the audience. These hustings are for us, the members of the Conservative Party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our next leader. He or she will be announced on the 5th of September, and as we're the party of government, then we'll become Prime Minister very soon after. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of these hustings in 2019, said, and I quote, I found chairing the hustings a remarkably positive experience. The members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask you tonight to make your questions searching, to make them succinct, and to ask questions and not make statements. One question each, please, so we get as many questions from the audience as possible. Both of our candidates have a duty and have expressed a desire to fulfill our 2019 manifesto. Their differences will be about how to achieve that in a very different world from 2019, post-Brexit, post-COVID, in uncertain times internationally, as we can see from the Ukraine and Taiwan, and where our union as a nation is being challenged. So I'm sure that you want to test our candidates to seek to establish their strengths and to see who you think is best capable of running our great country. As we're all Conservatives here tonight, I know that you'll be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. For them, for me, and for our CCHQ team, who have worked so diligently to set up these hustings at short notice in midsummer, these hustings run on a tight schedule until we finish with a final rally in London on the 31st of October, or even the 31st of August. <laughs> Thankfully, it's not going on that long. As you know, the ballot has opened, and many of you will have received your ballot papers in the post, and you can vote online or by post. It's very easy to vote online, or you can choose traditional snail mail, and if you do post, then please remember, we're trying to save money and to put a stamp on the envelope. <laughs> I hope tonight that you'll go away enthused and energized in your commitment to helping our party win the next election. We need your help and support. Finally, there's a couple of people here who I'd like to thank. The first is Katie Bourne, our Sussex Police and Crime Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. 
we, we've known each other for about 10 years, Katie, and I was very pleased to be involved in your first campaign. And then the second person is John Belsey, our regional chairman for the Southeast. John, you're doing a great job and it's much appreciated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Jimmy McLaughlin. Good evening, Eastbourne. It's great to be here by the beach on such a sunny afternoon. I wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name's Jimmy McLaughlin, and I'm the host of Jimmy's Jobs of the Future podcast. I've worked at every level in our party, and in 2016, I joined the Prime Minister as a special advisor in Downing Street on business and entrepreneurship. I did that role for three years and left in 2019 to start a family with my wife. A few months later, the pandemic hit, and my wife went back to work and I became very much a stay-at-home dad. It was a very different life to flying around the world on RAF Voyager. I had very much gone from Downing Street to diapers. <laughs> During this time, we listened to lots of podcasts and audio, not wanting to doom scroll at the time. And during that period, I thought, is there something that I can do to help tackle the unemployment crisis that was going to be coming up? And so, to that end, I started Jimmy's Jobs of the Future, interviewing entrepreneurs about where they're creating jobs and how they see the future of our economy looking. Because as Conservatives, we know that a strong economy comes from private enterprise and the risks that entrepreneurs take. That's partly what we'll be interviewing the candidates about this evening, about what their plans are for a strong economy. But this evening is about you and listening to what you've got to say. I hope your ballot papers have arrived today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the various camps to the stage. Thank you very much. Please welcome Member of Parliament for Wealdon, Nuz Ghani. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Eastbourne. It's good to be on home turf in East Sussex and to see so many friendly faces. Now, many of you might have seen me on TV. I've been a bit busy with the 1922 committee. And as vice chair of the 1922 committee, I had to be neutral for the first part of this election. Now, I no longer have to be neutral. And many of you have asked which candidate I will back. Only our party, the Conservative Party, could have put together, put forward, two stellar candidates with such a wealth of experience, vision, and yes, diversity. And the choice we have to make at this election, I know, is momentous for our country and the future of our party. And I'm here to tell you that I have chosen. And I have chosen to support Liz Truss, our brilliant foreign secretary. I could tell you that the reason I have chosen to support Liz Truss is because I have faith in her campaign, and I do. Liz's plan for our country is bold, just like her, and it's conservative. She will cut bills and steer us through the energy and economic crisis. She will cut taxes that deprive our families of their income and that prevent your businesses from investing to grow in our economy. She will defend the unity of our nation and protect the peace in Northern Ireland. I could tell you that I have chosen to support Liz Truss, whose record in government is second to none, who has delivered dozens of post-Brexit trade deals, who stood up against the tide of identity politics, who stood up to Russia, 
and was brave enough to stand up to China. And many of you know that will be close to my heart as an MP who's been sanctioned both by Putin and the only female MP that's been sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party and President Xi. Now, all of these are good reasons to support Liz Truss. She doesn't know this, but I'm actually here to tell you something else. It's about her character. Liz is straightforward. When she tells you she's going to do something, you can trust her that it will get done. Liz listens. When colleagues come forward with ideas or problems to solve, she engages with them. She is inclusive. I've been a minister and now I'm a backbencher, and my experience with Liz Truss is that she is both fair and honest. She reaches out and she unites the party. I hope that you agree with me. That's what makes a good leader. In these uncertain times and challenges our party faces in government, it is Liz that's going to bring us together. It's only by working together that we can deliver change for the better. It's only by working together that we can say truly, hand on heart, that the best days of our country are ahead of us. And what matters to you all? It is only by working together that we can focus and win the next general election. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honour and privilege to introduce my friend to you, Liz Truss. The United Kingdom is a great country. And I know that a united Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I negotiated deals with allies like Australia and Japan creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles, low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party and a government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to deliver that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Liz Truss. Everybody, it's fantastic to be here in Eastbourne. I wasn't brought up in a traditional conservative household. Is the mic not working? Oh, sorry, I think we've got a mic issue. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Ah, well done. I wasn't brought up in a traditional conservative household. I was brought up in Paisley in Scotland and in Leeds, where I went to a comprehensive school. And what I saw at my school is I saw children who were let down. They were let down by low expectations because of the background they'd come from. They were let down by a poor and patchy quality of education from Leeds City Council, who were often more interested in political correctness than they were in making sure the kids got English and maths right. And they were also let down by a lack of opportunities. And that's what made me want to go into politics, because I hated to see that waste of talent. And I want our country to be successful. I want everybody, wherever they're from, whatever their background, to have those opportunities, and I want us to be an aspiration nation. But the reality is we're facing difficult economic times. We have the backlash from COVID, and we also have the war in Ukraine
being perpetrated by Vladimir Putin. And we know that we are facing some very, very difficult issues. We've had decades of low growth in this country. So now, my friends, is not the time for business as usual. We need to be bold, and we need to do things differently. And I would have a bold plan for economic growth. First of all, that means unleashing those post-Brexit opportunities, changing our regulations, getting all of those EU laws off our statute books by the end of 2023, including our laws on procurement and investment. So we're investing more in the manufacturing parts of our country. I'd also reverse the increase in national insurance. We shouldn't have put it up in the first place. It was a manifesto commitment not to. And we can still afford to pay for health and social care out of general taxation and afford to pay down the debt starting in three years' time. I'd also make sure we have a temporary moratorium on the green levy to cut people's fuel bills because we know people are struggling to pay for food and pay for fuel at the moment. I believe that as Conservatives, we need to be on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. People who run businesses, people who are self-employed, people who go into work every day. Those, those are the people whose side we need to be on. I would also... I, I would... I think, I think we have some infiltrators, and I, wa I will wait until they uh, are evicted. We are the UK say a few words on the militant people who try and disrupt our country and who try and disrupt our democratic process and try and disrupt our essential services. I would legislate immediately to make sure that we are standing up to militant trade unions who stop ordinary commuters getting into work. And I would legislate to protect our essential services. And I will make sure that militant activists, such as Extinction Rebellion, are not able to disrupt ordinary people who work hard and do the right thing and go into work. And I will never, ever, ever allow our democracy to be disrupted by unfair protests. Now, I know, I know the vast majority of people in Eastbourne and around the southeast are hard-working people who want to do the right thing. And those are the people we're on the side of, and those are the people that we will stand up for. We'll stand up for our farmers, who do such a fantastic job producing great food, great crops, great wine in the vineyards, around this area. And I want to make sure our fields are full of those great crops, not full of solar panels. So I will focus on our farmers producing food rather than filling in forms. Before I became a Conservative MP, I was a councillor. 
and I sat on a planning committee. And I'm afraid to say those are hours of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> because, because the fact is, my friends, that what happened was that you thought you were making a decision, but you'd be overruled by bureaucrats in Bristol or by people in Whitehall with top-down planning targets. And what I would do is I would abolish those targets, and I would do that in the levelling up bill that is going through Parliament at the moment. And instead, I would put in place low-tax investment zones driven by local people that included not just homes, but also businesses and infrastructure. So local people could have development where they thought it was right, not where the bureaucrats thought it was right. We also need to stand up to Vladimir Putin. We know that if he is successful in Ukraine, and we're doing all we can to help the Ukrainians, that he won't stop there. That he will want to roll back democracy right across Eastern Europe. He's been very clear about his plans. That's why I'm proud that we were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. And I, as Foreign Secretary, put the toughest sanctions regime on Russia of any country in the world. But we can't be complacent about our defence because we know that European security has been threatened. So what I would do is raise our defence spending to 3% of GDP by the end of this decade <laughs> to make sure we are able to afford proper security and defence. And I will also deal with the people traffickers making a misery of lives with the small boats in the English Channel. I worked with Priti Patel on the Rwanda scheme. It is the right idea and we need to extend it to more countries. But we also need to legislate in the British Bill of Rights to make sure that we can't be overruled by the ECHR because it's vitally important that we protect our own borders. And we also need to make sure we also need to make sure that France is held to account for its role in protecting the borders. Now, I spoke, I spoke to my French counterpart last week to make it very clear that we expect French border guards to be working all hours in Dover to make sure that our border is protected. And I will continue to make sure that that is the case. As well as protecting freedom and democracy around the world, and we have an important role to do that, we also need to make sure it's protected here in the UK. And I think we've just seen an example, my friends, of attempts to disrupt a democratic process. But I'm a plain-speaking Yorkshire woman. I know that a woman is a woman. And we need to protect our single-sex spaces, our domestic violence shelters, and you know, fantastic work is done by our PCCs on dealing with domestic violence and dealing with crime. And we need to make sure women and girls are protected. We also need to fight back against the identity politics that has infected our institutions. I'm proud of our country's history. I'm proud of what we've achieved. I'm proud to go out into the world as the UK Foreign Secretary. But we need more of that sense of pride here in Britain itself. Our best days are ahead of us. I don't believe the narrative of decline. I don't believe the naysayers. And I want us to be proud to promote that. And I want us to be proud to be Conservatives. Because the people that voted Conservative in 2019 didn't vote Conservative because they wanted Labour policies. They voted Conservative because they believe and share our values, whether that's about enterprise, whether it's about hard work, whether it's about supporting the family, whether it's about personal responsibility. That's why people voted Conservative. And those are the people and those are the values we need to stand up for. But we also need to deliver because we made huge promises in 2019 
about how we were going to unleash opportunity across the country. And I'm somebody that can deliver that. I've shown in the Department of Trade where I delivered dozens of trade deals, even though people said it wouldn't be possible to do as well as the EU, we've delivered more deals than the EU in a much shorter period of time. At the Foreign Office, I've delivered the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to resolve the issues that we have with the protocol and restore the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. And I've stood up to Vladimir Putin. I've worked with our counterparts across the free world to make sure that Ukraine hasn't been sold out. And I will deliver as Prime Minister. I will make sure we fulfil all of our promises in the 2019 manifesto and more. And what's more, I'll take the fight to the opposition. To Keir Starmer, yet another North London Labour leader who is completely out of touch with what people in this country want. Or the Green Party, who, who, talk, who talk about being green, but let the rubbish pile up on the streets of Brighton. Or the Liberal Democrats, or the Liberal Democrats, who are better at faking bar charts than they are, they are at delivering anything. And my friends, we can work together, we can have all of the Conservative Party on the pitch, delivering for Britain, and we can win the next general election. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I just wanted to go through some of the housekeeping rules for this evening. There's going to be no protesters, please, further. <laughs> They've paid their £25 Conservative tax, a tax that we can all be in favour of. <laughs> what I wanted to say is there are going to be people with white hoodies walking around. They are going to be the people that have the microphones that we are going to be using for the questions when we get to that page. Um, that will be really important. So make sure you flag them down and say that you'd like to ask a question. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Team Rishi Sunak to the stage. Please welcome Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab. My friends, welcome. I remember first meeting Rishi Sunak when he first entered Parliament back in 2015. Imbued with the work ethic, the business experience and the family values instilled in him by his parents. In particular, when he worked in his mum's pharmacy, doing the books, delivering prescriptions on his bike for those elderly patients that couldn't make it in to the chemists. That enterprise outlook nurtured by a career in business, backing firms with bright ideas that just needed some investment so that they could scale up. Rishi's story, Rishi's values, enterprise, hard work, family, they're our values, they're conservative values. And almost immediately after the 2015 election, of course we all faced that very difficult decision on which way to vote and campaign in the EU referendum. And there was all sorts of pressure on MPs, particularly new MPs, to back Remain. But Rishi has never taken the easy option in his life. And he told me, and I remember the conversation very well, he said, what's the point in working so hard to get to the House of Commons as an MP, and then if you get there, you don't stand up for your convictions? Well, I remember, he didn't blink, he didn't hide, and he didn't just back leave and campaign for it, but he immediately started thinking about how to grasp the enormous opportunities that Brexit presents for our great country. He wrote the seminal paper on Freeports back in 2016. He delivered the first ones as Chancellor in 2021, and that's Rishi all over. Actions, not just words. Now, as Chancellor in the biggest crisis we've endured since the war, 
Rishi put together a rescue package to save jobs and businesses to get our economy back on track. Here in Eastbourne alone, Rishi's rescue package saved over 18,000 people their jobs through the furlough scheme. Thousands of businesses in Eastbourne benefited from £90 million in government-backed loans. 19,000 self-employed got the support they needed, and that's just here in Eastbourne. When you needed him, Rishi was there for you. And I know that as we face another global challenge, the fight against inflation, that Rishi is the candidate with the credible plan to get inflation down, to get investment up in those sectors, particularly important for your businesses to thrive, tourism, digital, manufacturing, and to cut taxes, but when it will help, not hurt people. Because the alternative choice in this contest is unfunded tax cuts to the tune of 50 billion pounds, which will just put more debt on our children's shoulders. That's not fair. That's not conservative. Tax cuts that drive up inflation and interest rates, that's not conservative either. Just think about it for a moment. A tax cut of £400 that costs you £7,000 on your mortgage. I think that's a pretty lousy deal, and it's a lousy deal that would hand the keys of number 10 to Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. Don't just take my word for it. On Thursday, Nigel Lawson... Margaret Thatcher's tax-cutting chancellor warned that those proposals would risk an inflationary spiral that would cost us the next election. Which, my friends, brings me to my final point. We all want to, to win the next election. And the polling demonstrates that from Lib Dem facing seats like my own, like Eastbourne, right the way through to those northern red wall seats we won at the last election, whether it's Remain voters, Leave voters, North, South, town, country, suburbs, Rishi is the best placed candidate to beat Keir Starmer and to win the next election so that we avoid the disaster of a Labour government propped up by the SNP and the Lib Dems. <laughs> My friends, we can't let that happen. So let's make Rishi our next Prime Minister. Thank you very much. My values. Traditional conservative values are clear. Hard work, patriotism, fairness, a love of family, pragmatism, but also an unshakable belief that we can build a better future. Here in East Sussex and across the nation, the economy is going to be the key challenge. We need an exceptional person to lead this country. With answers to the huge challenges facing Britain. I know he's someone who approaches tough decisions with honesty and integrity. I've got complete confidence in him and I'm supporting him for our leadership. Please welcome Rishi Sunak. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. It's fantastic to be with you here tonight. In fact, it's fantastic to be out and about across the country talking to all of you, all our members. Great to be sharing ideas about the future. Also great to be taking so many selfies, it turns out. <laughs> Although, honestly, I've never been happier when a member asked me to take a selfie with one of their children. Finally, someone my own size to take the photo with. <laughs> But look, I'm, uh, I'm standing here tonight for one very simple reason, and that's because our country did something completely extraordinary for my family 60 years ago. 
when it welcomed them here as immigrants and allowed them to build a better life. Now, I was raised with a set of simple values that are core to who I am. The first among those is that family means everything to me because the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate, and we must never, ever forget that. In my family, we prioritised hard work as the best way to forge ahead in life. My dad was an NHS GP. My mum ran the local chemist in Southampton, where I grew up. And I spent all my time working in her shop, out and about, delivering medicines and doing her books, her accounts, her payroll, and saw the power of that small business to provide jobs and opportunity in our local community. Now, for my parents, the best way that they felt they could give a better future to their three children was simple, and it was through education. And I passionately believe today that the best way that you reduce inequality in society, the best way that you spread opportunity, indeed, the best way that you transform lives is to ensure that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. So in a nutshell, those are my values. Patriotism, family, service, hard work, aspiration. And I know, looking at all of you here tonight, that those are probably your values too. And that's because they're conservative values. And my story is an entirely conservative story. And that's why I want to be your next prime minister, to put those conservative values into action, to build a better Britain. And just as our country allowed my family to provide amazing opportunities for me as Prime Minister, I want to do the same for everyone, your children and grandchildren, to make sure they have the same fantastic opportunities too. But how are we going to do that? Well, we need to do three things. We need to restore trust. We need to rebuild the economy. And we need to reunite our country. Now, in order to restore trust, we have to start with honesty. And as you can see in this leadership race, I have not taken the easy path. Because I believe our country does face some significant challenges. And I want to be straight with everyone about those and what is going to be required to deal with them. And even though it doesn't make my life easy, I believe it is honest. And that is what leadership is about. But we also restore trust by delivering on the things that we say, the things that matter to people. That's why I've set out a plan to finally start reforming the NHS so we can focus less on how much money we're always putting in and more about the efficient, better health care that we're getting out and getting the backlogs down. It's why I want to restore trust with our rural communities by supporting farmers, supporting food security and protecting agricultural land for food production and not solar panels. It's why, it's why I want to restore trust back into the planning system to ensure that local communities here and across the country are the ones themselves that decide where to build their homes, how to protect their green spaces, and not be told what to do by centrally imposed targets from Whitehall. And we restore trust also by standing up for the things we believe in. And that means I will be incredibly robust in standing up against that lefty, woke culture that is trying to cancel our history, our values, and indeed our women. Yeah. And finally, to restore trust, we need to tackle the issue of illegal migration. Because for too long, all of us have watched on our TV screens scenes of people coming here in boats, and it's simply unacceptable, and it has to stop. With my bold plan, under my leadership, we will finally get to grips with that issue, stop people coming here illegally, control our borders, and restore trust back in the system.
Now, when it comes to the economy, I don't need to tell any of you, you know what the number one challenge is. We heard it yesterday. It's inflation. Inflation is the enemy that makes everyone poorer. And we've seen this story before. It reduces living standards. It erodes people's hard-earned savings and pensions. It pushes up mortgage rates. So of course I want to help people with the cost of living, just as I did over the past two years. That's why this autumn we'll cut VAT on energy bills. But what I'm not going to do is pursue policies that risk making the situation far worse and last far longer, especially if what those policies amount to is billion, borrowing billions and billions, tens of billions of pounds in unfunded promises that we just put on the country's credit card and then ask our children and our grandchildren to pick up the tab. Now surely that isn't right. It's not responsible and it is certainly not conservative. <laughs> but I will cut taxes and I've set out a plan to radically cut the basic rate of income tax so that my conservative government can always reward people's hard work. But we're going to do that responsibly by being disciplined on public services and public spending and by growing the economy. Which is why this autumn I want to radically reform our business taxes to support and incentivize those businesses that are actually investing in the economy and innovating more because that's how you drive growth. I want to be radical about seizing the opportunities of Brexit as I did as Chancellor to make sure that this is the most dynamic economy in the world for business. And I want to level up everywhere. And as you may have seen from a video clip that's online, I don't believe that's just about our very large urban cities. I believe it's about investing and leveling up in small towns, in rural communities, in coastal communities like those here in the southeast. <laughs> now, when it comes to reuniting our country, in just a couple of years, we have to do something very special. We have to make British political history and that's winning a fifth election in a row. Now that has never been done before, but I am confident that working together, all of us, we can do it. But it's gonna mean that we have to appeal to swing voters everywhere. Here in the Southeast, in the North, in the Midlands, in liberal-leaning areas, in Labour-leaning areas, in Brexit-supporting areas, in Remain-supporting areas, in Wales and in Scotland. And I passionately believe, and all the evidence supports it, that I am the candidate that offers our party the best opportunity of winning that election and ensuring Keir Starmer never walks through the doors of number 10 Downing Street. <laughs> so in conclusion, I'll just say this. You saw me as chancellor act radically, boldly, ripping up the rule book, competently, to support millions of people's jobs and businesses through a very difficult time, to make sure that our economy was resilient through the storm. And as your Prime Minister, I will bring that same sense of urgency and grip and competence and radicalism to every other aspect of government, to build a Britain where our children can walk safely on the streets and our borders are secure where we, the NHS is always there for us when we need it, reformed and efficient, using the best technology, where we've made our schools the envy of the world, and we've created an economy that is creating jobs and prosperity in every part by harnessing the future innovations that we will create. That's the better Britain that I will build. But more than that, I promise you this. I will give you my everything, my heart, my soul, to ensure that each and every one of you here this evening will always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be your next party leader, but also the next Prime Minister of our great country. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly ask, how 
many people are more than 90% decided which way they're going to vote. I'm not asking which way, but raise your hands if you have decided. And if you've got a t-shirt on and you don't put your hand up, I'm going to dog you into the campaigns. <laughs> All right, so about 25% or so then. Interesting. Interesting. And how many of you have received the ballot papers? Oh, yes. CCHQ are going to be chuffed with that. That's a, that's a, that, that's a uh, very good amount there. Um, and they told us that all the leadership contests were going to be the same. And then we get all the protesters in like that. Uh, I'm very relieved that it didn't happen when I was on stage. That's got to be the, uh, the, the main thing I was concerned about, what we were going to have to do with that at that point. All right, without further ado, please welcome Liz Truss to the stage. So the first question that I wanted to ask is that there's a generation that are sort of 35 and under that have effectively only ever known a sort of permanent sense of crisis almost, whether it be the financial crash, Brexit, COVID, and now the news from the Bank of England yesterday about possibly one of the longest recessions we've ever seen and the tightest squeeze on living standards. What's your pitch going to be to win a fifth term? Well, the generation of people who have you know, grown up recently, the under 30s. First of all, I think that they are natural conservatives. They're more likely to have started up their own business than older generations. They're more likely to have a side hustle in whatever work they do. They're doing things alongside it. I think we've seen a real generation of self-starters who've had to cope with the difficulties of COVID. I've got two daughters, aged 13 and 16. I know it's been tough for them, being out of school, but I do think it's also created a certain kind of resilience. So I think we've got an incredibly talented generation coming through. And I think what we have to show as conservatives is we're on their side. So one thing I would do is make sure people who rent are able to use their rental history to get a mortgage. So it's easier for young people to get on the housing ladder. I want to be able to hold universities to account better to make sure that they are providing face-to-face -face tuition uh, as well. And, and also, I want to look at some of the levels of interest in the student loan system to make sure that those students and ex-students are getting a fair deal. But fundamentally, what we need to do is we need to show people that there is hope and there is an optimistic future ahead of us. And as I said, we're brilliant at startups but we need to be better at funding the scale-ups. So one of the things I would do is unleash more investment into our economy through reforming solvency too. I met some investors in the city this morning. They told me that if we get on and do that, we could release tens of billions. I mean, we can create you know, the British version of Silicon Valley. You know, we can create real opportunities. We have a talented generation of young people ready to take those opportunities on, but we need to get the growth and we need to... You know, I know there are difficult forecasts out there, but forecasts are not destiny. And what we shouldn't be doing is talking ourselves into a recession. We should be keeping, we should be keeping taxes low. You know, doing all of those things we can now do differently because we've left the EU and really show, show young people in particular the huge benefits of being a conservative. And let's pick up on something specific there in terms of when it comes to the energy bills, because that is something that is, that is rising. And by the start of next year, you're up to the point where an average household could almost be spending 20% of their monthly income on energy. But they're people protected by the cap to an extent. Businesses aren't. And if you're going to be in creating a product this winter as a business, it's going to be really tough. What can we do to help those people? Well, first of all, reversing the national insurance raise will help business and that's important keeping corporation tax low will help business and help keep us competitive that's also important but what i want to do is have more incentives for the oil and gas companies to use resources in the north sea to exploit more gas i want us to frack in parts of the country that where there's local support 
so that we can get so that we can get the energy security we need. And also what I want to see is fast forwarding of things like small modular nuclear reactors, nuclear projects. We need to be quicker at building projects. That is another thing that's too slow at the moment. And I would legislate to reform some of the rules that allow us to move forward on those things earlier. I just want to say one more thing about young people. I mean, people may know about me that I have a bit of a dubious past. And that when I was a teenager, I was a member of the Liberal Democrats. But I, I, I sorry, sorry. Um, you know, we all made mistakes. We all made mistakes. We all had teenage misadventures, and that was mine. The some you've people, ever done. yeah, some people have, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was in the Liberal Democrats. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but I became a conservative because I met people who were like minded, and I thought, I believe in what they're talking about. You know, and it was, for me, it was about personal freedom, the ability to shape your own life and shape your own destiny. And that's what motivated me to become a conservative. So I think. Talking about our ideas is really important and you know, talking to other people and reaching out from the party. I think sometimes the Conservative Party is very, very good at raising money and we should make the same kind of effort that we make raising money, reaching out to new people and convincing them about our ideas because that's what motivated me to switch at that age. And what was the moment that you decided to sort of step in to the arena, as it were? Because we've got a thousand members here this evening. Many will have served as local councillors and thought about filling out that kind of parliamentary candidate's <laughs> form. What was the moment that thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this? Well, uh, I was sort of, ac I was active in local association. I became chairman of the association, to be honest, because nobody else wanted to do the job. Uh, so... <laughs> Obviously, it was a very highly, highly, it was, it was quite a small association. London, I became chairman, no one else wanted to do the job. And then, you know, I became a councillor. And at the same time, I, I was just really interested in, I was working in the, the oil and gas industry at the time. It was an interesting job, but I thought politics was something more. Politics could help shape our country's future. And I think that's what made me sign up uh, to get on the candidates list. And what is the, the... The Governor of the Bank of England today talked about people that have left the workforce and actually this yeah. being one of the biggest domestic pressures that we've got on inflation aside from Russia and so on. What will you do to encourage those people back to the workforce? What can we do about that? Well, the, the Governor is right. The reason we have an inflation problem is it's a supp supply-side problem. There is not enough supply in our economy. That is why... Things like reducing national insurance will help contribute to fulfilling those supply needs. So it's not inflationary, it's actually going to help deal with inflationary pressures. Likewise, keeping corporation tax low will help new investment and help develop supply in the economy. Uh, on the point about people, you're absolutely right. There are 5 million people in Britain who are economically inactive. I think we used to call that being unemployed, uh, but we now call that economically inactive. What I would do is look at the incentives in the benefit system, but also make sure that we are providing opportunity, or rather the private sector is providing opportunities. So when I talk about investment zones, that is about using a conservative way, low taxes to attract businesses to an area. At the same time, let's get people who are uh, currently not in the workforce, encourage those people to apply for those jobs. So it's a combination of you know, incentives within the benefit system, as well as actively providing people with the skills and training they need to do those jobs. But it is a massive challenge for our country. I know there are shortage of skills in hospitality, in social care, in farming, and we really do need to work to get more people back into the workplace after COVID. You only need to go down Eastbourne uh, Beach and see the amount of... Is that of where you've food. been, Jimmy? It is indeed. <laughs> well, I spent the afternoon I'm glad there. you've been having a good time. <laughs> You're enjoying this really, Liz. Don't, <laughs> don't tell me otherwise. If you were 22 in 2022, what sector do you think you'd be looking at? Because there's so much innovation happening out there, as you say. Where do you think you'd be looking to go? Look, I think there are all kinds of exciting, exciting industries. I talked earlier about the local wine industry here, which is booming. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fields are full of vineyards, which is fantastic to see. And I do, I do like wine. I think that'd be a good sector uh, to be part of. I think the tech industry is fantastic in Britain. But what we're brilliant at is the startups. 
and then there isn't enough funding coming through. So this is why I want to unlock that investment in the city into tech startups right across the country and also make sure we've all got the super fast broadband we need uh, to actually be able to run those types of businesses. But what more can we do to support fast growing startups, the scale up sector? Because we aren't as good as that. We are very good at starting businesses, but we're not as good as that growth side. What could we do on that side? The, so I, this morning, I met a group of funds uh, talking about exactly how do we unlock investment. And it is things like changing the solvency to rules, which are very, very risk averse on how much how much capital is allowed to be released. Changing those rules would unlock huge levels of investment, which could go into helping Britain have a much faster growing tech sector, a much faster growing sort of scale up sector. So as you say, we're very good at the small businesses, but we need the next generation of Microsofts and Googles to be in Britain, not just to be in the United States. And that's, that's why I think it's so important to take advantage of these post-Brexit freedoms. And how can we get more share ownership is at its lowest level since the 1980s in terms of people holding these companies and having a stake in our future. How can we improve that? Well, I think that, that's a very good point. I think uh, one of the things we have been doing is working to make it easier to IPO in this country, to float your company uh, in, this, in this country. I think we as conservatives should be talking about share ownership and property ownership more. Sometimes I think we've been a bit afraid to talk about conservative principles, but we value a society where people have shares, where they own property, where they own a stake in the future. And I think that is partly a communication problem, but it's also about making life easier for retail investors. Uh, using technology better, I think, is important as well. Interesting. We're going to come to audience questions in just a moment, so get ready to approach the people with the mics. But just before we do that, I wanted to ask you what your favourite podcast was, aside from Jimmy's Jobs, of course. Jimmy's Jobs is obviously my favourite podcast. I do actually like a podcast which is called Women with Balls. Uh, and I don't know if people... It's by Katie Balls of The Spectator. It's not any, um, any reference to... Uh, male genitalia or anything like that. And um, yes, I do think that's very good because it has a lot of punchy women on it. Very important as well. Right, so we're going to go to questions on that. Let's go down first here. So, yeah, just, we're just, just right down. I might just the, stand up. Yeah, yeah, so I have like literally it. gone for the person right behind you. So that, <laughs> with, with a Liz Banner, so. Right, could you hold it for me, please? Right. Hi, I'm Tara Moore. I'm 37 and I'm significantly impaired. I'm also the uh, a Brexit campaign manager. Considering there's a load, there, there are many of the population with an invisible disability or significant impairment, do you know what personal independence payments are and how will your government ensure that we get meaningful employment. Well, thank you. Tara, first of all, I think what you are advocating for is incredibly important. To be honest, I don't know the level of personal independence payment, but what I do is that what I want is to make it much easier for people in your position to get into jobs and also have the opportunity to set up your own businesses. And I know that the Department of Work and Pensions is working on how we do this better and how we help. You're, you're shaking your head. You're obviously not happy uh, with the Department of Work and Pensions. And what I'd want to do is talk to you about how can we help, uh, help deal with the issues that you face in getting employment? How can we make it better uh, in terms of the available opportunities, including being able to start up your own business. And I would want to do that as Prime Minister because my focus is unlocking the talent and potential of every single person in this country, and that includes your talent and potential. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I've got an eye for the next general election. The red wall voters were very, very important to us at the last election. What do you think you can do to retain the most of those votes 
going again to the Conservatives. Well, you're right about the red wall voters. They were incredibly important. And as somebody who comes from the north of England, I found it incredibly heartening that m many people, you know, in places like West Yorkshire, uh, in places like uh, you know, County Durham, voted Conservative for the first time. And the reason they voted Conservative is they were fed up of years and years of Labour letting their area down. And they didn't want to be patronised. They didn't want handouts. They didn't necessarily want more government spending. What they want is opportunities, jobs and enterprise. And that's why it's so important that we help industries like the steel industry become more competitive internationally. It's why it's important that we get the investment into our manufacturing industries by reforming things like Solvency II. And it's also important that we deliver what we said we would deliver in 2019. We promised new hospitals, we promised new railway lines, we promised new roads, we promised fibre. Uh, you're right, it does cost money, but there is money in the budget for it, but sometimes I'm afraid there's too much government bureaucracy in the way of getting it done. And what I can say to you is I am somebody who doesn't take no for an answer from Whitehall. I push things through, uh, regardless of some of the protests. And what I would make sure is that if elected as your Prime Minister this autumn, I will put those projects on fast track. So we're delivering for people. And so by 2024, we have spades in the ground, in the red wall seats, and in seats across England where we've made promises, including here at Eastbourne, uh, where I know we're promising a hospital, you know, I will make sure those things happen because people will see whether or not we deliver, and that's what's important. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I don't think you've got a mic. Hang on. I, yeah, just, hang on. Just, you go, sir. Go. No. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, somebody obviously has a mic at the back who shouldn't have one. <laughs> sorry for the interruption, everybody. Uh, could, could I just say, Jimmy, that I take it as a compliment that I'm so popular with Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> Anyway. You touched upon um, getting people back to work. Um, from my perspective, from the introduction of the new health and care bill um, and with it now being introduced, especially with the introduction of you know, palliative care and end of life care, um, it's a very specialist field. Um, and having spoken to a lot of people, um, how do you intend to not only cover the chasm that there is within the, uh, within the care sector of specialist people, but how do you intend to retain them? That seems, that seems to be one of the biggest issues we've got. It's not actually employing people or getting people into those jobs, but it's actually retaining them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I said earlier on, I would make sure that the money that we have allocated to, to health and social care goes to social care. Because I do think that's where some of the biggest issues are. And what we have at the moment is people in NHS hospital beds because there isn't enough space in social care. So by giving the money to local councils to fund social care, we'll also be freeing up space in the National Health Service. But you are right. You are right about the motivation of frontline people in the health service and in social care and partly it's about funding I understand that I know there are issue about mileage rates for people in social care I know there are issues about wages and we can help with the national insurance reverse for example on things like wages but it is also about the respect people are treated with it's about the level of centralized bureaucracy that we particularly experience in the NHS so it's also about treating people with respect and making sure people are empowered on the front line to do their jobs so the jobs are as fulfilling as possible. I think that's very, very important. 
And how can we make sure that the NHS is able to keep pace with the private sector in terms of the different array of flexibility they're now able to offer in terms of working from home, etc.? People like teachers and nurses and doctors aren't going to have that flexibility. And actually, early on in their careers, they're sort of sent to all parts of the country with very little control. What can the government do to kind of enforce a bit of a more flexibility in that? Well, I have to say, there's quite a lot of the private sector who want more of their staff to be in the office as well. So I don't think it's just the public sector. I do think it is important that we get more people back into offices because we need to make sure our town centres and city centres thrive. But also you learn from other people when you're in work, when you're talking to each other. And I think whilst it worked to some extent during COVID, I certainly got Zoom fatigue. I know a lot of people in the civil service got Zoom fatigue. So I think we do need to try and encourage people to come into the office you know, more than they do at present. I think there is a case for more flexibility in terms of where people are um, allocated to within the National Health Service, for example. And I think there's a, lot, there's a big case for more local control. At the moment, what I hear is people are frustrated by the level of central diktat. They're frustrated by the number of levels of management above them. And I think by having more local control, you help empower people, you make jobs more fulfilling and rewarding, and you also get things done better. Because the people locally know much better than the people in Whitehall about what's going on and how to fix the problems. Liz, um, Vladimir Putin must have been over the moon when Boris fell, and certainly the Ukrainians were very unhappy about it. What will you do to make Putin feel a little less smug and to put heart into the gallant <laughs> Ukrainians? Well, you know, you are right that Boris Johnson is hugely respected in Ukraine. You know, there's both a street and a croissant named after him, and I don't think many, I don't think many international leaders have achieved that. And it is because of the leadership we've shown in Ukraine, not just in supporting the Ukrainians, but also standing up to Russia and calling out Putin, calling out Lavrov, calling out the appalling aggression that has characterised you know, Russia over the, last, over the last 10 to 15 years. And I know, having dealt directly with Russia, that they are concerned about the stance that we've taken, that they can see the leadership we've shown. And I can assure you, I will continue to do that. I will con continue to stand up to Putin, stand up to Lavrov, but also put, the, put our money where our mouth is. And it's important that it's not just about rhetoric, that it's also hard security the UK is investing in. That's why I intend to increase defence spending to 3% of GDP and also rev review our integrated review to make sure it's dealing with the threat that we now face on European shores, which is much worse than it was five or 10 years ago. Uh, thank you for all you've said so far. Uh, I'm in the hospitality sector, and I, want, I, I, I was listening to you say that you want to get some of that five million people back into work. I would like you to help me deal with the following cases. I was trying to employ people to help in my business, and on five occasions, I had people accepting jobs, and then were told that they're part-time jobs, they can't afford to take them because they would lose their benefits mm -hmm. more than I was able to pay yes. them. Thank you. Well, you, you make absolutely the right point, and this is my point about making the incentives in the benefit system work, so people are better off when they take up jobs. And we made some changes because of COVID. COVID is now over. We now need to change the benefit system back. And we also need to more actively be encouraging people into work. Because it's not just damaging your business, uh, the ability to get people to work in it. It's also costing taxpayers money as well. So it's a win-win to change the system to help those people back into work. And I'm determined to do that.
Hi, Liz. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm also a mum of a 13 and a 16-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about what you would do to help children recover from lost learning after COVID? Well, during COVID, we developed a large number of tutors across the country. And what I would want to use is use those tutors to help children catch up. I would also want to make sure we're dealing with the mental health issues resulting from COVID. I know how hard it was for young people to be isolated during that time when they should have been with their friends, they should have been at school. So what I would want is more mental health support in our schools to help teachers out as well. I think that's very important. I also want to support schools to offer more wraparound care for children. I think that's really important for working parents and it also helps children you know, get more of that social exposure, which is so important to their development. But uh, I know from having a 13 and six year old daughter, it is a, it's an exciting age, but it's also a challenging age. And I think one of the big problems parents face is mobile phones and social media and kids contacting each other and winding each other up on WhatsApp uh, is one of my, my, uh, my, my concerns, I can tell you about teenagers. Sounds like a Tory MP's WhatsApp group sometimes. But, uh, it's not as bad as that. <laughs> I don't think, I, I'm not sure teenage girls are as bad as Tory MP's. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> that's being a bit strong. Gentlemen here. Mike Staples, chair of the uh, Conservative Policy Forum in Lewis and letter writer to the Telegraph. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with, with hindsight, the mathematical modelling that led to lockdown may have caused more harm than good. Um, we just heard some reference to it. Um, bef before restricting our right to heat our homes and drive our cars, will you critically examine the scientific groupthink for um, net zero? Well. Although, although I am a fan of mathematics, and in fact, one of the things I did as education minister was create the new big maths GCSE that my daughter has just sat, which she's not particularly happy about because she was saying, Mum, why did I have to sit all those extra papers? And it was basically down to me uh, when I was education minister. I do think sometimes we use mathematical models where they're not appropriate. And you know, the housing algorithm is a similar case where you know, it's a human decision whether or not to build houses in a local community. It shouldn't be down to an algorithm. So I think we've always got to be very careful to intermediate with our own thinking about what is right for our society. Uh, having been through the lockdowns and seen the experiences of other countries, I do think we went too far. And I would not want to have another lockdown and no lockdown would happen under my leadership, I can assure you of that. But, but on, the subject of this, on the subject of net zero, we do need to transition to net zero, but I want to do so in a way that doesn't clobber households and doesn't clobber businesses. That's why I'd have immediate moratorium on the green energy levy, while we look at better ways of delivering net zero that are using private sector innovation and technology to deliver it. And at the meeting I had in the city this morning, you know, there are tens of billions of pounds chasing that green investment. That is what we should be doing. We should be looking at how we get that green investment into our economy at the same time as using gas as a transition fuel. Because I think that's going to be incredibly important in the run up to this winter, where Vladimir Putin is going to try and play games with, the Europe, with European gas supply is that we are using our own resources in the North Sea. Um, so you talk about the need to um, implement new laws to stop annoying protests. Being a student of Sussex University, I can very much empathize with that. Uh, we got a great display of it earlier were, were here today. Were some of your friends? Probably. Um, <laughs> so I'm just concerned about how that's going to be done whilst balancing the crucial right to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So I completely agree with freedom of speech and freedom of expression. What I think is wrong 
is when Extinction Rebellion activists glue themselves to trains and disrupt commuters who are going about their business. And likewise, you know, I am fine with peaceful protests, but you know, the, the situation we had in Parliament Square with a whole bunch of people camped in tents for week on e weeks on end is not the same as peaceful protest. So to me, you know, I'm a believer in freedom to do as you want, provided you don't harm others. That's the, that's the fundamental concept for me. But what I think we've got to a stage of in our society is where there is deliberately disruptive activity, which isn't just about peaceful protests. It's about trying to disrupt you know, democracy, trying to disrupt people's everyday lives. And I think that is a problem. So there's a, there's a balance to be struck. But one person's freedom should not mean that other people suffer misery. Liz, I had two quick final questions. There's been a lot of blue on blue in this um, leadership election, as there inevitably is going to be. But I wanted to know, what do you think is your opponent's greatest strength? So Rishi is somebody I've worked with in Cabinet. He's a very intelligent person. He's a very competent minister. And I would be very pleased that if I'm successful in this contest, if he would work, work with me in our team. And a final one. And it's a very specific one and personal to me. You also have in con um, common with him the fact that you are a parent to two daughters. And as we have recently welcomed our second daughter into the world, I wondered if you'd got any advice on bringing up daughters in the 21st century. So my number one piece of advice is delay as long as possible them getting a smartphone. That is, that is genuine advice to every parent because the minute they get their hands on it, it's an absolute nightmare. You know, I, I, I had to introduce this idea of a locked box to put their phone in, which was an old petty cash box because it was just being completely abused. So I think that's my number one piece of advice is keep them off the mobile phones as long as possible and try and work with other parents in a club to uh, stop them using peer pressure to, to get onto phones and social media. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Liz. That's been a brilliant session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My wife is certainly going to be chuffed with that answer in terms of adding that to the, uh, to the list of that. Um, and without too much further ado, I wanted to welcome Rishi Sunak to the stage. Good to see you, Rishi. So, 18 months time, you're about to go to the country and call a general election, and you are going off the back of the toughest economic squeeze that people have ever felt in their pockets, and the longest recession that we may well have ever seen, according to the Bank of England. What's going to be your pitch to the country to win a record fifth term? Well, the first thing we need to do in order to make sure we can win that election is have got through this inflation problem by then, right? And that's why I'm particularly worried about policies that risk making it worse and last longer. Because if this is a problem that isn't just for this winter, it's a problem for next winter as well and beyond, because as the Bank of England said, they're worried about inflation becoming embedded, then there's no hope that we're going to win that next election. Absolutely none, right? It's as simple as that. We all heard what they said yesterday. All of you saw the numbers. And if we don't get a grip of this thing and get a grip of it fast, then we can kiss goodbye to winning that next election. So the first thing to put ourselves in a position to win is to get through inflation and get through it quickly and not do things worse. But then, thank you, right? But then, no, I, I, so we'll get that done. Under my leadership, you know I've got a plan. We're going to grip it. We're going to get through it. We'll help people in the short term. But that's not enough, right? We've got to build a vision of the Britain that we want to see. We want to see our kids grow up in. And I talked a little bit about it in my speech. It's delivering on the things that we talked about. It's finally reforming the NHS so that people are not waiting 
a year for treatment that they need and deserve because we've got to grips with it. We found the efficiency there. It's making sure that our schools are the envy of the world because that's how we're going to provide a better future for our kids. It's making sure that we get tough on crime so that our women and girls can walk around the streets safely. And it's about building an economy that in every part of the country is creating jobs and opportunity and prosperity for people. And if they feel that that's all happening, that we delivered on the things that we said, that we're building that better Britain, then they're absolutely going to come and re-elect us. But it is going to mean we have to appeal to people everywhere. And as I said earlier, I'm the person that can appeal to those swing voters and ensure that we beat Keir Starmer at that general election. And of all the challenges that we're going to be faced this winter, as we were talking about, those companies that produce products aren't going to be protected by the energy cap and are going to be facing huge bills. What specifically are you going to be able to do for those high intensive businesses? Yeah, well, the, the most important thing that we need to do this winter is, is help people, is help families, particularly the most vulnerable families, through what is going to be a very difficult period, right? And some of the proposals that you've heard elsewhere are not going to do that, quite frankly. And that's why, as Chancellor, I announced support that was particularly targeted at the most vulnerable. And any compassionate Conservative government, I'm sure everyone in this room would, want to make sure that those in our society who are going to just struggle too much with bills that are going up £1,000, £1,500, get the help they need. That's got to be the priority. That's what I did as Chancellor. That's what I'll do as Prime Minister. Now, in terms of getting businesses to grow, the things we need to do are focus on what's going to achieve that, right? Now, we've had this debate on corporation tax. Right? I don't want to stick with the failed policies of the past. Right? That's what some people are suggesting. It hasn't worked. If we want businesses to actually invest in the economy, to expand their factories, to put more lines in, to produce more things, that's how we create more jobs, that's how we'll get inflation down if companies are producing more. We need to cut the taxes on those things. Focusing on corporation tax hasn't achieved that. Investment in this economy today, no better than it was a decade ago, in spite of us doing all those things on corporation tax, because it's not the right tax to focus on. And that's where my experience in business, my time as chancellor, my conversations with business have led me to the conclusion we need to be much more radical. We need to reform business taxes to cut them on the things that make a difference. And that's business investment, business innovation. If we get those tax cuts in place, then we can help those businesses expand, grow, create jobs and prosperity, and crucially, help get inflation down. Because as I said before, if we don't do that, we're all in real trouble. And on that, there is a challenge that's happened at the bank we're talking about this morning. The fact that lots of people have not returned to the um, workforce, you know, half a million, perhaps even more. Some of it's long COVID, and then there's lots of other reasons as well that are being attributed to it. How do we actually persuade them back to the workforce? Yeah, well, you know, the answer is, is not cancelling the NHS and social care levy, because actually, as people, people know, or cutting NI more generally, if you're over the state pension age, and many of the people who have left the workforce are those older people, you don't pay any national insurance anyway, right? So that's not going to help if that's the reason that you think they left. So what we do need to do is make sure that we have the right kind of workforce or the right kind of working conditions for those people to be attracted back. And actually, as Chancellor, I spent some time talking to lots of them, and we started to figure out how can we do this. Because you're absolutely right, we're short of about half a million workers, disproportionately elderly. Now, what they say is it's far less about the money. It's much more about the flexibility of how they work. Because they want to work, but they want to work part time, half the week, a couple of days, three days. And we need companies to actually adjust the jobs that they're offering in order to entice these people back into the workforce. Now, they also, because they only work part time, they don't earn huge amounts. And because we raised the threshold, Last month, that's what I did, at which you can earn money without paying a penny of national insurance. Actually, they're not paying very much tax, these people, because they're not earning a huge amount, and we've taken them out of paying any tax. So focusing purely on tax as the answer is just wrong, right? Because that's not the issue here. These people are making a lifestyle decision, and they can't find the jobs that suit their new lifestyle. And that's the thing that we're going to need to crack. And the government can't do that alone. We need to work with industry and private sector to create much more flexible jobs for them, and for those that want to pick up a new skill that doesn't take very long, that can take a few weeks, we need to make sure we have those kind of opportunities for them to do that fast. As Chancellor and a Minister beforehand, you're taking dozens of and dozens of decisions every day. What is one that you would look back on and approach differently now? Well, there's, oh, I'm sure there's many, right? <laughs> you know, when you're making policy in the crisis, when you've only got hours and days 
to get things right. It's, I mean, it's almost impossible to get everything right. And we didn't have a playbook, right? When I, was, when I became chancellor three weeks later, I was doing a budget. A week after that, coronavirus hit. And there was no playbook. There was no manual sitting there in the treasury that said, OK, this is what you do when you have to shut an entire country down. I was having to come up with these things fast and then make sure that they actually worked. And I'm proud of my record in doing that. And I think, by and large, you know, we protected over 10 million jobs, protected businesses. People were forecasting unemployment would spiral into the millions, 14%. But because of the things I put in place, it didn't. And I'm going to bring that same degree of radicalism and competence to all the other aspects of government. But the things that, look, we clearly struggled to get right at the beginning were getting cash out to companies. And we had to set up lots of different ways to get loans. Many of you in this audience may have benefited from them. And we started with one loan program with the banks, but it just wasn't quick enough. And companies were saying, if we don't get cash now, we're out of business by the end of the week. So we had to create a new loan program, the Bounce Back Loan Program, that did solve that problem. But you know, we had to come back to that to get that right. And actually, the last thing was the, the thing that you just talked about, was earlier on, I would like to have started focusing on this issue of people leaving the workforce and figure out if there are things we could do to have stopped them leaving in the first place. Because it's actually hard to attract people back. And actually, if we'd known that this was happening, maybe with the things that we could have done quicker up front. OK. And Britain is one of the best places in the world to start a business. But something that we're not as good at is scaling businesses. And it's a problem now that is becoming ever more apparent in terms of people, the cultural side of people not wanting to grow and scale as much as happens in the US, for example. What would you do to change that? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think the answer is actually lots more money and financing, right? And people will say, oh, these scale-up businesses, they need lots of capital, and we, should, you know, we can reform lots of financial markets to do that. We can do that, and we should do that. And I started that work as chancellor, because as you know, this is an area I know very well. This is my background professionally. If you talk to anyone at any of those businesses, what will they say? They'll say the number one thing they need is people, right? That if you talk to any entrepreneur in the UK, growing a company, and you know this from your experience, what do they all say? What's the limiting factor in their growth? It's getting amazing talent, right? So that means you've got to focus on that side of the equation. You've got to make sure that we're training young people. We're giving them all the routes that they need, not just university, but apprenticeships too, other short courses, because it's not just about degrees. And we've got to have a visa system that attracts the best and the brightest from all around the world. Because if you look at that, those companies that you're talking about, over half of them, have a founder that wasn't actually born here in the UK. If you look at all our STEM researchers across all our UK, UK universities, around half of them also not born here in the UK. So yes, I want to clamp down on illegal migration. Yes, I want to control our borders. But if we're going to grow our economy, we need to be a beacon of talent for the best and the brightest anywhere in the world. And that's why as Chancellor, thank you. You are. What was the moment that you decided that you wanted to become a parliamentary candidate? What was the time from becoming a member of the Conservative Party to actually becoming a thinking, I want to step into the arena and I want to do something? What was that moment? Yeah, it was inspired by my parents that you heard me talk about. And they're obviously not political, but they, they worked in primary health care. My dad was a GP, my mum was a chemist. That's the world I grew up in. And everywhere I would go in Southampton when I was out delivering medicines, all people would just stop us at the weekends. You know, they'd see me and they'd say, ah, oh, you're Dr. Sunak's son. You're Mrs. Sunak's son. And then they would proceed to tell me something about what my parents had done for them, their parents, grandparents, kids. And that always stayed with me. I found that incredibly inspiring that they as individuals... Well, because I, well, <laughs> that's not my, not my strong point, and you're probably all the better off for it <laughs> as well. Um, but, you know, I found that inspiring, that they as individuals could have such an impact on our community, and that's why I wanted to be a Member of Parliament, and I want to have that same impact on the community that I'm privileged to represent in my new home in North Yorkshire. And I think all the MPs here and those who are councillors will feel exactly that same thing. It's an incredibly rewarding thing to be able to make a difference 
to the people who are your responsibility to represent. And that was my driving force for it. So I had it you know, growing up, and then you know, at some point, I wanted to act on it. But you know, I do believe you're better off in politics if you've had actually a real career in something. And my career was in business first to bring that experience to Parliament. But it was that. It was inspired by my parents and how they served our community. And if you were 22 in 22, what career do you think you'd be going into? Because in the early noughties, it was very much banking was the kind of like what people, ambitious people wanted to go into. What do you think it'd be now? Yeah, I think one, one thing that's crystal clear, and again, I'm biased because it's my own background and experience, but you know, young people are much more interested in entrepreneurial careers now, right? And they're much more interested in working for new companies, not necessarily all the big companies, and they're much more interested in changing jobs more frequently. And I think that's something that we should celebrate and support. Look, for me, if it was me, you know, I definitely want to do something that was doing something different, doing something new, creating a new product, a new service that we don't have today that's all going to improve our lives and transform the world in which we live. That's the kind of culture that I experienced when I was living in California. And I think it's incredibly inspiring and empowering. So look, if I was a young person, I'd want to go and do something like that. And you can do that in every industry. It's not just, when you think about it, it's not just pure technology. Actually, I met an amazing um, business recently, and they're doing agri-tech, right? And we know we all want to improve our food security in this country. We want to grow more fruit, grow more vegetables here. That's good for us, good for inflation. And there are amazing British companies that are using cutting-edge techniques to do all of that here, actually. And that would be great for the economy. And that's just an example of using technology in a way that's going to solve a big problem for us. And now, that would be something exciting to do. Absolutely. Right, and now we're going to take some audience questions. Right. And arms go straight up in this. We'll go to the gentleman yes. over there. There's someone here, right? Yeah, yeah. I've... Oh, yeah. We're just, we're just waiting for the mic, if you just go across there. I've been really awkward there. I used to do the mics, and David Cameron used to make me run from side to side as a joke. I'm sure he did. R Rishi, whoever, whoever gets the top job is facing a problem as big as the COVID problem. I think one of the good things that came out of COVID was the daily TV reports with the different experts in there giving the country data so that country could come with you. Can you, if you get the top job, or as half the audience will say, when you get the top, top job, um, <laughs> can, can, you, can you commit to giving the country data? There are too many things. You can't get to a GP. You can't sign up. You can't go to the dentist. My son wants a driving license. He can't get a driving test. There's all these basic, basic things which aren't working. Can you publish some data and then come back each week and tell the country what you've done to improve those things. I think that would win you the next, and us, the next election. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you make an excellent point. And look, I remember those press conferences vividly because I had to do so many of them, right? And uh, in fact, you, that's probably where you all first saw me, right? I mean, I, I got the, the, you know, suddenly there I was at this press conference next to the Prime Minister, and all of you were like, who is this guy? Right, and uh, this pandemic was about to hit and I had to stand up and do these things. And I did, you know what, I like you. So many people say to me that they got enormous reassurance from those press conferences and they liked being spoken to like adults and being explained what was going on. And I thought that was great, right? And look, I think as you can see in this leadership contest, I'm happy to subject myself to all the scrutiny there is. I'm, you know, I'll happily have anyone interview me as you've seen in this leadership contest because I think that's how you build trust. Right? And one of the things we need to do is rebuild trust back into government. And that comes from being transparent with the country, from being honest about what we're doing. And data is a big part of it. But I would say that you mentioned all those things. You're right. Uh, data is helpful because it will help us figure out where the problems are. But what you also need is courage. You need, to, you need to be radical. You need to be bold if we're going to reform public services like the NHS. We can have all the data in the world. But if we're not going to actually confront some of the conventions, we're not going to do things differently, like I want to tackle this issue of missed hospital appointments because it is actually costing us all a fortune and depriving people of care, right? If we're not going to do those things with the data, there's no point because that's what I want to do. I want to reform public services with the data. I want to make them more efficient for all of you because that's how we're going to cut all your taxes. And that's the plan. It's reform public services so that we can cut your taxes. That's a conservative way to do the governing that we want to see. Hey Rishi, um, so Bitcoin has been around for 13 years and uh, but it and other crypto assets are still a rapidly growing industry that can create jobs and extensive prosperity to our country. So what will you do to allow the UK to become a world leader in the Bitcoin and crypto industry? Thank you. <laughs> 
did, Jim, did, Jimmy, did Jimmy set you up to ask that question, right? Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> look, I, look, I mean, you heard me talk about my experience in California. I'm a deep believer that we should embrace technology and innovation as a way to improve all our lives and make things better, make things cheaper, make things faster. And as chancellor, I, I, you know, I set out actually a really positive vision for how we can get the regulation right to support the innovation in cryptocurrency, not just Bitcoin, distributed ledger technology, the blockchain that underlies it, uh, so that we can reap the benefits. And actually, we've got it right. And the industry was incredibly excited about my proposals, which were better than those in the US, better than those in Europe. And as we've always done in this country, we do things better than those competitors, because we know how to regulate flexibly, not burden people with red tape, because the innovation is going to make everyone's lives better. And it's not just about how many bitcoins you can buy, it's about how we can change supply chains to make things cheaper, help make border and customs processes more efficient, how we can actually solve the appointments issue in the NHS using that technology, how we can make the cheaper and easier for you all to bank. That's the real benefit of all those things. And I want the UK to be the home of that innovation. And I put us on a path to deliver it as Chancellor and as Prime Minister. You better believe I want to see that come to fruition. Go Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Hi, sir. Um, I come from Wildon, nice area to live, area of outstanding natural beauty. One of the biggest problems we've got is planning. Yes. House builders are all over us. Uh, the Conservatives are losing council seats right, left and centre to the Lib Dems and the Greens. Now, we've heard from you and from Liz that you both want to change the system of top-down levels of housing. But can we believe you? Because at the moment, I know Wildon have been battling away with the minister, or whichever one it is this week, uh, try, trying to convince them that their methodology is wrong, that the numbers are wrong, and that they know best where housing should go in our area. And they're falling on deaf ears. So how can we trust what you've been saying to us tonight? Yeah. Right. Well, look, sir. I actually I met with your council leader today and we talked about this very issue. And you've heard from me what I want to do about it. There shouldn't be top-down targets imposed on places like Wildon that don't take into account the very particular local circumstances, particularly as you guys have got about, I think, 80 or 85 percent of the land is an AON and B. It's an area of outstanding natural beauty. And the planning inspector needs to be told that that needs to be taken into account. When you're deciding how you want to build your houses, no one can tell you what to do without realizing that that is something that needs to be protected. And under my leadership and the plans I want to put in place, it will be protected because I want to protect your green spaces and trust you to get on with the job of delivering houses for your community in the way that you think the best. Right? But the other thing we need to do to help you is tackle this issue of build out because you have done a great job in Wildon Council of actually making sure that we can have the right housing in the right places, because we all want people to enjoy that feeling that many of us had of getting the keys to our first home. It's very special. And you guys are doing a great job of that. But you know who's letting us down? The developers. Right? Because, yeah, because you, you and Wildon in particular have actually approved homes, but they're not being built. The developers are sitting on the land. And I think that's wrong, and we need to stop it, and we need to give you the powers to charge them or buy the land back or not give them any more planning permissions until they've built them out. Those are the plans that I outlined today, and they're going to help you. Elected at 20, unseating a Lib Dem by 15 votes last year. <laughs> My residents in Westway Ward have come to me with concerns about their social housing that is run by the Residents Association Lib Dem Administration at Tandridge District Council. Uh, what legislation are you going to put into place as Prime Minister to ensure that local councils and housing associations uh, have the best um, quality social housing. Right, Taylor, well, first of all, enormous congratulations to you. That's a cracking result. Well done. Uh, look, I don't have an immediate answer for you. I, I thought we were already in the process of making sure that there were standards that were put in place or to make sure that people have high quality homes. It was called the decent home standard, and we were in the process of implementing it because you're right, people deserve to have homes that are fit for habitation. And when that's not happening, the people doing that should be held to account, particularly 
because they're using government funds to build those homes. So it's simply unacceptable. We should not have tolerance for it. And I'm happy to take it away with you and figure out what we need to do to make it right. Simple as that. I'm just conscious I'm not picking anyone from behind me because it's really difficult to sort of spin around. So let's have that lady, uh, let's have that lady there. Thank you very much. Um, Rishi, you seem like a lovely chap and you've talked about trust a lot, which is great, but we all know that sometimes people don't do what you want them to do and you have to be tough and hold people to account. How can you reassure us that you'll be tough when you need to be when people aren't performing? Yeah. Well, look, that's a, it's a great question, right? And the simple, simple answer is, look, I, I had to do it in my business career, right? Everyone's got a lot of commentary on you know, where I am today and all the things that I'm fortunate to enjoy. I didn't get there by being easy on people. I got there by being tough, right? If you want to succeed in business, you need to be able to do that, and that's what I've done. But I've also demonstrated that in politics, right? And Dom talked about it. When it came to the Brexit decision, a lot of pressure was put on me to do something I didn't want to do. And even though that, that was going to be difficult for me, I wanted to stick with my principles. I toughed it out because I backed what I believe. I backed Britain and I backed Brexit. When it came to Omicron last Christmas, I was actually in California on a business trip trying to make sure that we can get all the innovation that we need here in the UK. And it was clear that this country was about to sleepwalk into another lockdown because that's what the establishment wanted. That was the default lever that they always pulled. And I was convinced it was wrong for our country. So I came back here. I didn't see my family over the Christmas holidays because every day I sat here and made sure that I fought against that, even though that was difficult because at some points it was me and one other person against an entire room. But I wanted to fight for what was right for this country. Hi. Rishi, um, given the, the current migrant crisis and the government's Rwanda policy, as a sovereign nation, we can, but more importantly, should we leave the European Court of Human Rights? Yeah. Well, so we may have to, and no option should be off the table. So for those of you who are interested in this topic, on my website, there's a detailed 10-point plan for how I want to tackle this issue. There's a video. I'll give you two things that we need to do out of that plan right now. One is we need to move away from the ECHR definition of asylum, because it's very broad. It's being exploited by lefty lawyers. It means it's very difficult for us to send people back. So I want to move to a different standard, a different international standard that's narrower and tighter, and that will help us execute the policy. A second thing we need to do is join up our foreign policy. At the moment, we're in this slightly odd situation where we'll talk to a country about a trade deal we might give them. We'll go even further and talk to them about the aid that we're going to give them. But at the same time, we don't tell them they have to take back their failed asylum seekers. Right? That's clearly bonkers. Right? So we need to be tougher on things like that. So there's a range of other things in my plan to grip this situation. Dominic, who you heard from earlier, has got a new British Bill of Rights. It's also going to help. I want to see if all those things work. But if they don't, then no option will be off the table because we have to make the Rwanda policy work and I will do whatever it takes to make it work because we must have control of our borders. <laughs> Good evening. My question to you, Rishi, is uh, about inflation. I'd like to know how you intend to get inflation under control, given that it's been fuelled by global supply chain issues, soaring global energy costs, and the war in the Ukraine. Well, this is the most important question that confronts our country at the moment. The most important one, man. You all heard what the Bank of England said. And as I said the other night, the warning lights on our economy are flashing red. And the root cause of that is inflation. And yes, it's primarily driven by international causes, but not exclusively. And increasingly is becoming domestic. So the first thing we need to do, if we're going to grip this, is not make the situation worse and put fuel on the fire and repeat the mistakes of the past. And as you heard from Nigel Lawson, Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor, about those just the other day. I believe that pumping 40, 50 billion pounds, I can't keep up, of borrowed money into an economy that's already seeing an inflation spiral is enormously risky. It is taking a big gamble with your savings, your pensions, and your mortgage rates, and that is not a gamble that I'm prepared to take. The first thing we need to do is not make the situation worse. The second thing we need to do 
is to support people through the autumn and the winter, the moments who most need our help with the cost of living, which of course we'll do. And then, longer term, how do we get inflation down? We increase the supply of things, right? That's reasonably easy for us to grasp. Where do we have inflation? We have it in our labour market, which is why we need to get much tougher on welfare, because at the moment there are more people on unemployment benefit than there are job vacancies in the economy. That's not right. We need to be conservative about that. We need to reform welfare to get those people into work and ease some of those bottlenecks. We need more homegrown food, as I talked to be about. We need more homegrown energy, whether it's offshore wind or new nuclear reactors that are going to power our homes. And we need to get our businesses investing. And that's why the tax cuts that I talked about are focused on those businesses that are actually expanding production, expanding capacity, investing and growing. Because if we get them to do that, to get through these bottlenecks and increase supply, that's how we'll get inflation down. So it's not just a problem this winter, and that's it, because I don't want it to be a problem next winter and beyond. So that's my plan to grip it. But I tell you, the most important thing is not to repeat the mistakes of the past and put fuel on the fire of a problem which we're already suffering. That's not going to help any of you in this room. It's not going to help our country, and it is going to mean that we lose the next election. Um, we all got a sheet of paper identifying the policies that both you and Liz Trust put forward. I was very disappointed, and I know a lot of young people in particular will have been very disappointed. There was absolutely no coverage of uh, climate change or environmental problems. That is not a secondary problem. It's a priority that we invest and we influence the whole world to invest in recovering there. What will you do about it? Yes. Well, look, uh, I have two young girls, so I have, two, I have two little girls, and for the last couple of years, while I've had this you know, important job, they are not remotely interested in it, for the most part, and they, uh, the one thing they ask me about is, Daddy, what are you doing about the environment, right? What are you doing about climate change? That's all they really are interested in, right? So I don't want to let them down, first and foremost, and in the same way you've heard me talk passionately about the public finances, the borrowing and the debt that we leave to our kids and our grandkids, I'm equally passionate about the environment that we leave them, because we're conservatives. We work hard to build a better future and leave something for our kids. That's a very conservative instinct, and it goes for the environment as it does for anything else. But look, yeah, I do believe in our net zero target. I want us to get there in a measured way, because there is no point in us racing there harder and faster than any other country, because that will just both impoverish us and lose people's support on the journey, and I don't want that, right? So we need to do it in a measured way. And the way we're going to solve that problem is not by getting people to give up all the things they love. It's not about putting up all their bills. It's about innovation. It's about what I talked about. It's about building that innovation economy of the future where our scientists, our researchers, our entrepreneurial companies are creating the solutions to the problem. Whether it's a new generation of small modular reactors that we can not only use here, but we can export around the world. Whether it's energy storage, whether it's more better use of our environmental agricultural land. That's exactly what we're already doing. But it's not just about government investment, right? That's not the conservative answer to this. It's not about, well, how much money can the government throw at this problem? It's about unlocking the creativity, ingenuity, entrepreneurship of the private sector. That's where conservatives, that's what we believe. <laughs> right. I asked you in January for your advice on having two daughters, and you said be very kind to your parents is the first thing, and that, is, <laughs> that, 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 is, that has been absolutely <laughs> true, and they're there in the audience. Well, I don't know who, who's babysitting tonight. <laughs> yeah, 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 so. cool. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, I just wanted to um, say, like, it's obviously been a tough leadership contest, lots of blue on blue. You've spent a lot of time with uh, your opponent in the last couple of weeks, and are going to spend another month as well travelling the country together. What do you most admire in what she's trying to do? I, I mean, I think what Liz is great at is explaining conservative values, right? I mean, she's great at having, being, having high conviction in conservative values and being unashamed about them, as I am, right? That's something that we both passionately believe. I think the other thing about Liz, as you, I'm sure, saw this evening, as you'll see from both of us over the next four weeks, is... But we all know in this room, and Liz and I know, who the real opponent is here. It's not me, it's not Liz, it's not any of the other people that were standing in this leadership contest, right? We know who it is, and in a few weeks' time, we're all one family here, right? We're all one team, we're on the same team, we're on the same family. We're going to come together, we're going to serve the British people, build a better Britain, and then we're going to take the fight to Keir Starmer. 
And whether that's Liz or me, I know that she cares equally about that as I do, as all of you in this room do. Because if we don't do that, all the things that we're discussing, all the values that we hold dear, it's all for naught if we can't win that next election. That's what she's focused on, that's what I'm focused on, and I know it's what all of you are focused on too. Brilliant. Been off that podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Rishi was clearly listening because he says you didn't ask me about my favourite podcast. And he said his just then is Faster Please. So make sure you check that out as well. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's been brilliant to have you all here. And as Rishi says, let's focus the next election on beating Keir Starmer. Thank you very much.